to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ and the lord god saw that it was not good for man to be alone Therefore he made a helper comparable to him. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18. We welcome you today to our study of godly homes in an ungodly world. We live in a world where sin is rampant, where the home is being threatened and attacked from every avenue and every way, and Satan is trying to have his way. In the home, one of the most fundamental relationships God made from the beginning. And in this series of lessons, we're thinking about how the Bible teaches us we can have a godly modeled home in a world that is often ungodly. And so we hope today that you'll, if you don't have your Bible handy, that you'll locate it as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study of godly homes. Today we're talking about specifically what marriage is, the act and the purpose of marriage. What makes a marriage? What's the purpose of marriage? How can we have a, a godly marriage? Those are things we're going to be discussing in today's lesson. And again, we're so glad that you've joined us. Our lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area They'd love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about the church, the plan of salvation, why they worship and teach the things they do, you'll find people in the Lord's Church who are concerned about souls, who are kind and friendly, would love to sit down and discuss the Word of God with you. And so we encourage you, visit the Church of Christ in your area. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of the Word of God. Check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have all our information uploaded to there, videos, audios, transcripts, study questions, written material, just a good host of Bible study material. All of it's available free of charge. And if you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons on godly homes in an ungodly world, we make that available to you free of charge as well. Go to our website, fill out a media request form. You can get that as a digital download or if you need it on a DVD for watching on your DVD player or a CD, maybe to listen to in the car, we'd be happy to send that to you free of charge as well. We'll even pay the postage. And friend, our main emphasis at the Gospel of Christ is to point people People to the Bible to take the whole gospel to the whole world. And so let's think today, what is the action of marriage? What is God's purpose? Why did God create marriage? What's it all about? What's the purpose? If we understand those things, that can help us so much in understanding about marriage. Marriage According to uh, Unger's Dictionary, Unger's Bible Dictionary, marriage is defined as this. Marriage is a divine institution designed to form a permanent union between a man and a woman that they might be helpful to one another. And so it's a union designed to be permanent to help one another get to heaven. And when we think about marriage, friend, that's hand in hand with the Bible definition of marriage. Listen to Matthew 19, 5 through 6. Jesus said, A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And of course, Jesus is referencing God's original pattern for marriage takes us back to the page, early pages of Genesis 2. For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so what do we know about some of the, the basic fundamental building blocks of what marriage is? Here's what we know. Marriage is instituted or ordained by God. Marriage is a relationship 
God started. God created marriage, not man. Genesis 2 verse 18 says, Therefore, man shall, uh, excuse me, Genesis 2 verse 18, God saw that it was not good for man to be alone. God didn't make us to be loners. God saw that it was not good for man to be alone. Therefore, He made him a helper comparable to him. And so marriage is started by God. It goes by His rules. It must live according to His laws. And it must bring Him honor and glory. And friend, as the home goes, since it's instituted by God, as the home goes, often so goes society and the church. The home plays a, such a pivotal role in everything. If our homes can truly be instituted and ordained by God to be a relationship that will honor Him and help each other, think about how that's going to help society and help the church. If people are acting right and living right in the home, they're going to act right and live right in society, and the church is going to be what God wants it to be as well because people are striving to do what God wants us to. What's another foundational building block to marriage? Marriage is also a covenant. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. The two are now becoming one flesh. Marriage is an agreement one willingly and seriously enters into. As we read Romans chapter 7, verses 2 through 3, the Bible teaches that it is for life. If while a woman's husband lives, she marries another, she'll be called an adulteress. But if he dies, she's free to remarry who she wishes uh, only in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. And so we have this idea that it's a covenant, it's a contract, it's an agreement that we enter into willingly and seriously. Nobody's forcing me into it. That's not the idea. I've got to make that choice. I've got to agree to that of my own free will. And it's something we approach with seriousness. That covenant is before God and before men. And when we say, I do, friend, we're making a commitment, a serious commitment that lasts for a lifetime. We want to emphasize especially the seriousness of the decision. I think too many times if people are not careful, they get uh, the attraction and the, the lust and the desire becomes such a big part of the decision making that they forget the seriousness of it. I'm making a commitment to help this person, to encourage this person, to work together with this person for life. No matter what we look like 20, 30 years from now, no matter how good or how bad this situation may be. No matter what hills we've got to climb, what challenges we've got to face, we're making a decision for life. And friend, that's a very serious thing to think about. But then realize this also. One of the foundational building blocks of marriage is when we marry someone, we're beginning a new home or family unit. By that we mean this. Genesis 2 verse 24. The Bible teaches, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and listen to this, and the two are now becoming one flesh. It is the creation. Marriage is the creation of a new family unit. Mom and dad have their family unit on both sides. When two people get married, they have their own family unit, meaning they've got to leave father and mother, they've got to come together, they've got to work things out based on the Word of God and how they work together. They've got to make their own decisions. They've got to stand on their own two feet. They've got to have their own failures and their own successes. Uh, families can encourage and help, but families also at times need to back off and let them be their own family unit and be what God wants them to be. As we think about the idea of marriage. If we can understand the act and the purpose of marriage, it's going to help so much to make our marriages successful. Let's think about some things that are such a great benefit as far as the purpose of marriage. Marriage is designed by God to provide needed companionship. I want you to look at Genesis 2 with me for just a moment, and I want you to see what happens here. God in creation 
has made Adam, and God goes through and He makes all kinds of birds of the air, beasts of the field, uh, fish of the sea, things like unto that. And yet in Genesis chapter 2, we're told something very unique. Look in Genesis chapter 2, and I want you to notice what the Bible says. We look in verse number 18 following. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. Notice this now. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, he slept, he took one of the ribs, closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. He brought her to Adam, and Adam said, This is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Did you hear twice where God said, It's not good for man to be alone, and a helper was not found comparable to him. Why did God create marriage? So that there could be a helper made for Adam, for each other, comparable to him. We're alike. We're unique. Uh, unique among all of God's creation because in Genesis 2 verse 7, the Lord God breathed into man the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Different from all the things God created is man and woman. And we are uniquely, listen to this, we are uniquely created for each other. Marriage is divine, is designed to provide needed companionship and help. I know I can't do it on my own. Philippians 4.13 tells me that. I can only do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But I also know along the way I need help. God's going to help me. There's no doubt the Bible's going to help me. Christ is going to help me. But friend, how wonderful it is. I've got somebody else to help me. God gave man a helpmate to provide needed companionship. We're in it together. I don't have to walk the road alone. Aren't you thankful you don't have to face every challenge alone? Every difficulty, every problem, every disappointment and, and a highlight that comes, I don't have to face it alone. I've got somebody to share that with. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, we are heirs of the grace of life together. What's that mean? We get to share in all the good things God has given us. And friend, one of the basis needs of any of man in any society is companionship. Ecclesiastes 4 verses 9 through 12, uh, if one man going down alone, he falls in the ditch, he's got nobody helping him. If two lie down together, they'll be warm and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Where there's, where there's, there's people to help, it's such a strength to us. And so when we think about marriage, let's realize how wonderful it is I have someone to share this life with, to be a companion, and to help me. And friend, don't, don't ever take that for granted. You know, sometimes I think in marriage, people still try to live in their separate spaces. And there's no doubt you need time on your own. I understand that. But friend, you don't have to face it alone. That's what marriage is all about. Another purpose of marriage, which we find in the early pages of the Bible, is to propagate the human race and to fulfill the desires that God gave man. Genesis 1 verse 28, God said to man, to his creation, be fruitful and multiply. God wants godly children. That's part of the marriage arrangement. And thus, He created one man, one woman, who can procreate, who can propagate the human race and create the family and the children that will bring honor to glory in God, honor and glory to God. And so, to propagate the human race is part of the purpose of marriage. Now, here's where society has gone off track on that. Society today often does not see marriage as important in propagating the human race. Two people don't have to be married. They can have those relations. They can still propagate the human race, uh, be a family, have children. Wait a minute now. 
if it doesn't meet God's design, and remember, God started marriage, is it really going to be the type of home and family and propagation of the human race that God wants it to be? And friend, the answer is a resounding no. And while we're not going to emphasize this idea over and over again when we talk about the subject of marriage, that's part of it, the reason God designed marriage, and it's a good, holy, right relationship within the marriage. Marriage is honorable. The bed undefiled, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Hebrews 13, 4. And friend, with this in mind, we also want to mention, if God, if part of the purpose of marriage is to propagate the human race, to have godly children, only a marriage between a man and a woman can do that. Two men can't do that. Two women can't do that. It's not the way God designed it. It's designed to be a man. Marriage is a man and a woman. That's the design for marriage, and it uniquely fits every one of the categories and characteristics God gives us. And along with this idea, let's also realize that part of the purpose of marriage is to prevent sexual immorality. God created man with a sexual desire. It is not that desire is God-given and used in the right way. It's good, but it's only reserved for marriage. Hebrews 13, 4, listen again. Marriage is honorable. The bed undefiled whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Where is the only authorized and licensed place where, place where relations can happen, sexual relations can happen between a man and a woman? Marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled. God gave man a good desire. That sexual desire is good and right, but it's only authorized inside the marriage relationship. And part of the purpose of marriage is to fulfill that desire and to help man be what God wants him to be in every way. In fact, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 2 through 5, Paul will in essence say, you know, it's better to marry than to burn with that desire. To control that desire, God created marriage and it is the right way to use that in a way that gives honor and glory to Almighty God. Well, let's also think about this then. If part of the purpose of marriage is the rightful use of that desire God gave man, then friend, please hear me well. Sex before marriage, premarital relations, that's not right. That's, you know, people think sex is just something to do like recreation today. It isn't any big deal to have sex before marriage. Friend, that's not the way God designed that relationship. While society promotes uh, this idea, while people don't look at it as a big deal, friend, such actions are sinful. Sex before marriage is sinful and ungodly in God's sight. Why? Because the Bible says marriage is the only place that's to happen. Hebrews 13, 4, uh, whoremongers and adulterers will be judged. Ephesians 5, verse 5, fornication, unlicensed sexual activity is not even to be named among us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, such were some of you, the Apostle Paul would say. And so to our young people, we make the encouragement, wait till marriage for things like that. That's designed for marriage. You're only ready for it when you enter into a marriage relationship in every way. And so keep the marriage relationship holy in that sense. Then, friend, and this is a big one, when we think about the act and purpose of marriage, I want to especially emphasize today that marriage is designed to help one another get to heaven. I want you to think about marriage like a triangle. At the bottom, we have the husband and we have the wife, and they're joined to each other. But listen to Matthew chapter 19, verses 5 through 6. There's another avenue to that. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. There's no doubt that husband and wife are joined to each other. But who does the joining? At the top of that triangle is God. And friend, listen carefully. The closer we are to God, the closer we are to each other. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Why did God create marriage? to help us, to help one another 
get to heaven. And so I want to I want to think about and I want to ask myself, what am I doing to encourage my spouse? Am I putting the kingdom first? And am I helping her or him to do the same thing as well? Are we praying together? Are we studying together? Are we uh, striving to worship God and live a life that's going to bring honor and glory to Him? Are we uh, taking evangelism together seriously? Are we taking steps? You know, we think of marriage as uh, an agreement and a contract, but do we think about it as an agreement that we're going to help one another get to heaven? I mean, don't you want to go to heaven, friend? Don't you want to live with, live with God forever? God gave you somebody. If you're married, God gave you somebody to help you along the way, to pick you up when you get down, to pat you on the back, maybe to hold you accountable and challenge you, maybe even rebuke you at times if need be. And we ought to be thankful that we can help and encourage one another in that way and strive for that marriage relationship. But you know, to make that relationship the way God wants it to be, we've got to let God and the Bible be our standard. I want you to I want you to see what makes a good godly home. Would you would you turn in your Bible to Psalm 127? When we think about the the act and the purpose of marriage. I want you to see a, a key ingredient to a godly marriage and a godly home is found in Psalm 127, verse number one. I want you to look at these words. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Isn't that a beautiful picture? What kind of home is going to be a godly home? A home where God builds it. Meaning, we're not talking about two by fours and brick and mortar. We're talking about the family. That's the Bible home, not the house, the home. God has to build that home, meaning He's got to be the foundation of it. Uh, husbands and wives should make it their goal to help one another and to help their children be godly. We want to we want to study the Bible together. 2 Timothy 2:15, study to show yourself approved unto God. We want to we want to pray together. 1 Peter 3 verse 7, we're to be heirs of the grace of life together so that our prayers are not hindered. We ought to be praying together. We want to put God. This is a big one. We want to put God before each other. Do you love God more than you love your mate? You ought to. You ought to love your mate immensely. But you ought to love God more than you love your mate and more than you love your children. God's Word has to be the standard for the home. Joshua said in the long ago in Joshua 24, 15, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The, we need to realize that as fathers and mothers in the home, we're going to set the standard and we need to set a standard that we're going to live by the Word of God, meaning... In this home, matters are going to be decided by God's Word. We're going to ask, what does the Scripture say? When, we, when a decision comes up, when a moral problem arises, when difficulty comes up, when we've got to make decisions, we want to ask, when God's the standard and His Word is, what does the Scripture say? Is there any word from the Lord on this subject we're thinking about? And, and our as spouses and as parents, we want to help one another to live up to the Word of God. We want to encourage our children to study the Bible, to look at it for themselves, and to really live like God wants them to live. But friend, let's also realize as we think about the act and the purpose of marriage, friend, we've got to make a real commitment to one another. And for the few minutes remaining, I want to think about that commitment with you because it's such a big deal today. I think sometimes people change marriages kind of like they change shoes or change clothes, get tired of one after a while and you just go get another one. It's not how marriage is designed. Think about the commitment for just a moment. When you stand at that altar with the person that you love and you say, I do, you're making, outside of becoming a Christian, which is the most serious commitment, you're making the second most important commitment that will help you with the first in all your life. What does that commitment mean? That commitment means that you're committed to leaving father and mother. Sometimes this becomes a problem because maybe the, the husband might say to the wife, well, that's not how mom did it or how dad did it. Or the wife might say, well, that's the, the way our family did it. Wait a minute now. 
What happened in previous families is not how you're going to necessarily work it in your family. You've got to be committed to leaving father and mother and leaning on and learning from one another. You've got to be committed to the permanency in marriage. God, listen to these words, Malachi 2, 16. Why is it permanent? God hates divorce. Why is it permanent? Jesus said, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. That's God's commit to it because that's what God committed to and wants you to commit to as well. Commit to this. Commit to facing the problems of life together, for better or for worse. Might somebody get sick? Possibly. Might somebody lose their job? Yeah, very likely. Is it the possibility that uh, somebody's going to have a crisis or somebody's going to be dealing with something emotionally or physically or spiritually? It probably will. If you're married long enough, those things are going to happen. But what I need to back up and remember is I committed to this. I said I would. I swore before, my, before God and others, I made an oath that I was going to help this person and commit to them no matter what. Friend, that's what we need to do. Be committed to, 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 to facing the problems of life together. And then do this. Be committed to providing for one another. 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, If a man won't provide for his own, he's denied the faith and he's worse than an infidel. Husbands, provide your family. Wives, provide for the families as well, especially on an emotional, spiritual, nurturing level, how much uh, encouragement and providing the wife can do in something like that. Are we saying wife can't work outside the home? That's not the idea. But each person is created unique and they ought to all bring something to the table they can provide and give to the family. And so here's what we ask today. The psalmist said this in Psalm 34 verse 3, O oh, magnify the Lord with me, let us exalt His name together. Do we really exalt God's name in our marriage? Are we magnifying God together? Friend, if our marriages are not what they ought to be, let's take these principles today and let's instill them in our home. And I promise you, your marriage can be great. We hope you'll join us next time as we study more about godly homes in an ungodly world. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the